Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg. So glad that you're with us tonight. Here's the local time. So glad that you're with us tonight. Here's the local time. Get that laptop. So we'll begin our talk on Lake Chelan at 6 p.m. local time. So if you're watching the replay, you can go ahead and skip ahead 12 minutes and um, catch us then. But in the meantime, uh, early birds, uh, hello, we've got uh, 130 people. Um, so glad you're with us. There's a few things to talk about. Um, it's uh, about 60 degrees here, uh, but we've got gusts up to 30 miles an hour on occasion. Everything's pretty much anchored down with a bunch of rocks and other things. Uh, it seems like that's a wider view than normal, but... got stuff blowing to the Columbia River here. Good thing I'm a sturdy fellow. I'm not going to blow anywhere. Don't, don't do it. I will right, we'll stay wide like that. Um, I showed you, if you were with us last time, which was, I right, actually, let's talk about that first. First of all, are we doing okay? Um, well, that's the whole point. Uh, both Saturday and Sunday this past weekend, our last two live streams, we ran into some trouble with audio and visual uh, stuff. On Saturday, we started buffering and kind of spazzing out about halfway through the lecture. I think it was about, yeah, about 30 minutes into the talk-ish. And then Sunday, which was the last time I was with you, if you weren't with us, about the same time, a few of you pointed it out. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but about the same time, about bottom of the hour, we just lost the live stream completely. So that was new. And I spent, I don't know, probably five minutes out here with my phone swearing, by the way, but I don't think that was coming through. And I turned off the wireless on my phone and turned it back on. I turned off the data. I turned the data back on. I tried to do all sorts of things without actually killing the stream. And I could see your, your comments continuing, but you couldn't see me or hear me, I don't believe. So eventually, so if you joined us for the Bridge of the Gods on Saturday, I'm sorry that we ran into that problem. It, it's still a bit of a mystery to me. You might have an idea. Nobody was home. It's not like Liz started doing something on our wireless. We actually have two channels here through Spectrum. This episode of Nick from Home, sponsored by Spectrum. You gotta love it. So no problems there. Anyway, my point is, actually we can talk a little bit more about that, but my point is, I do have things scheduled for this weekend. Let's 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 start talking about uh, this is kind of a revised schedule. So if I'm surprising you, I'm sorry. This is slightly different than what I showed you um, last time, I guess. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to talk about a fellow by the name of J. Harlan Bretz, and it's a little sampler of a brand new full lecture that I have. I don't want to do it all for you, but I'm going to give you some of the highlights of that. He's a very famous geologist that lived 100 years ago. So if you've never heard of this Brett's fellow, I think you'll enjoy this, especially if you know about the Ice Age floods. 
and then we'll continue talking about Ice Age floods on Thursday, going to a place called the Grand Coulee. If you're unfamiliar with North America, it's a very famous canyon. And then notice that I have a new time this weekend. So we were doing 10 a.m. last Saturday and Sunday. I want to do 9 a.m. with the thought that maybe, <laughs> it's a total guess actually, but just in case those buffering issues or streaming problems were not a coincidence and something really is happening in town at 10.30, I want to just do it at 9 o'clock and be, and be done by a little bit after 10. And then also you can see that we have a, a, a weird thing on Saturday morning, which I've already mentioned briefly, but I'm not going to be here on YouTube on Saturday morning. I'm going to be in a different place. I mean, physically, I'll be here in my backyard, but I'll be broadcasting through Facebook only uh, on a wonderful Facebook page called Learning Geology. So if you type in Learning Geology to Facebook, if you're a Facebook person, great, you can join us there. There's a large international audience, most of whom have never been to Washington State. So I'm kind of looking forward to that from that point of view. And then I think I'll be able to get a copy of that session and put it on this YouTube channel so that you can so that you can see it. So that's the plan for the week. We'll be kind of in the ice age all uh, most of the week, except for Sunday. We'll, I was trying to think of topics that would work with a, a broad audience since we did have a lot of overseas people last weekend. So super volcanoes is our discussion on Sunday. How are you all doing? The sun is absolutely brilliant and strong. I can barely see you here. That's okay. That, that'll that change. Um, would you, you probably already did, but would you mind? How are we doing? Uh, audio and visual right now. Streaming strong, good, or are you having problems already? Thank you. Hello, Australia. Perfect. Sounds good. Th yes. Nice. Good. Yeah, when we do have big, I think it's going to die down over the next hour, but it'll still be 20 mile an hour winds, I think, is the, um, I'm curious, is the wind audio um, an issue so far? Like, do you lose me? Do you lose my voice if, if we have a big, whatever, I can, re I can watch the replay, I can decide. Sun's at a bad angle for the chalkboard, okay. Sun's going to change, of course, over the next hour. I think I think I'll keep it with that for right now. I'll have a lot of uh, good maps and uh, oh, I got this. This episode brought to you by Marie Callender's Key Lime Pie. You gotta love it. That was an inspiration during my walk today where everybody had their masks on in the grocery store. That was kind of weird. Said, I'm gonna get a key lime pie and freeze it, or take it home from the freezer, put it in the freezer. So nothing from Vinman's Bakery tonight, but uh, I don't know, I just, key lime pie sounded good. So it's mainly an excuse for me to eat some pie tonight. I have a little demo that might work. With farming Lake Chelan. Most of you have figured out the comments by now. You know how to read the comments along. And uh, I don't know, I suppose it's a, it's a personal preference. Some feel like, you know, it's just distracting to see all this, you know, side conversation going on. Uh, I do re watch these replays. Um, and read all those comments and you, know, you, can, you can do what you like with the comments, man. Um, but it's interesting to see those comments. And if you're still frustrated that you can't figure out how to see the comments and you'd like to see the comments kind of scrolling by as I can see right now, 
Are you seeing me on your computer screen right now? And isn't there right down here, right down to the lower right, isn't there something that says top chat? Can't you just click on that and, and, and uh, have that, you can start to see comments coming through? That's where you would see it. And then this like button thing, which it's very kind that many of you in the comments are saying hit the like button and all that, but um, I have no big plans. So it's nice if people click the like button and I'm sure there's some math involving spreading the videos with likes or I have no idea actually, I've never looked into that, but it's okay. If you don't know where the like button is, it's okay. Or if you know where the like button is and you don't want to hit it, that's fine. If it makes you feel good to hit the, the down like, thumbs down, good for you. This is our windsock. So if it starts going like that, uh, I'm in Kansas. And I'll be back uh, as soon as I can find my way home. Just speaking of thumbs. Oh my God, we got a minute? Ish. We'll start the program on Lake Chelan in one minute. Thank you for joining us tonight. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. This is my backyard, and I'm glad that you're with us tonight. Uh, we've been doing these for a few weeks now, and we continue. Tonight, the topic is a beautiful lake in northern Washington that's a destination for many of us. Many of us are not in the right tax bracket to have a second home up there, but we still like going up there and Airbnb or camping or whatever, just go up for the day or make it a weekend. There's tons of traffic from Seattle over to Lake Chelan, up and over Blewett Pass, right by Rob's Gold Mine. And uh, not happening now, of course. It's a ghost town everywhere, but we'll get back there. We'll get back there one day where things will feel like they should. So I have plans tonight to talk about the formation of Lake Chelan some of the bedrock geology of the Lake Chelan area, which is very unique and has a specific story to tell. And we'll talk about earthquakes again tonight just a little bit because the biggest earthquake in Washington since the Civil War happened just south of Lake Chelan. On the east side of the Cascades, the biggest earthquake. So we'll get into that. Uh, many of you are on to me, you know what this is about. I pick topics that I have given full lectures on already. And uh, I've got dozens more, by the way. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to run out anytime soon. I made a list for myself actually yesterday, thinking about this week and then beyond. It's like, pfft, I've got dozens more. So the point is, I'm not having to do a bunch of research and things because I've already put these lectures together. And like this topic, I actually have to watch the lecture from a few years ago to remind myself of what was going on. So I have notes from watching the Lake Chelan lecture on YouTube. And I started that lecture with something I'd like to start with here. It's more than a lake that makes Lake Chelan and that area so interesting geologically. 
Here's my backyard in Ellensburg, Wenatchee. This white line is the Columbia River that we've already talked about a couple of times and will continue to talk about. We're heading out here into the channeled scablands tomorrow night and Thursday night at least. But the town of Chelan and this lake, which is 50 miles long and about a mile wide, there's more up there than just the lake. The lake is the star of the show, but there's other things as well. So we might touch on, at least with my program with you or with your live Q&A that's coming in about a half an hour-ish, we could touch on all these things that's on beautiful display in the Chelan area. Are you ready? What's up there in the Chelan area geologically? Well, there's a Canadian ice sheet. There are alpine glaciers. There's the third deepest lake in the United States. That's Lake Chelan. The Columbia River is flowing right by. Oh, good Lord. There's something called Glacial Lake Chelan. There's the Ice Age floods. There are flood basalts, German chocolate cake. There's exotic terrains, Baja BC. There's specific unique metamorphic rocks called migmatites. There's granite batholith. There's that big earthquake. I mean, if there's only one place to go to take a bunch of people from overseas, let's say you, all, you guys from, Europe and Asia, you've been watching, Australia, South America, you guys have been tuning in. If you all came, once these restrictions are lifted, and I picked you all up at SeaTac, and I only could take you to one place to give you a flavor for how rich and diverse the geology here is in Washington, I think I'd take you here. I think I'd take you to the Chelan area. So there's no shortage of stuff we can talk about tonight, but we're gonna start with the lake itself. Uh, many of you are not from Washington, so let's make sure we know exactly the lay of the land with Lake Chelan. So this is the Columbia River, and notice that the Columbia River flows right next to Lake Chelan, but there's no intersection between the two. And the little town of Chelan, less than 10,000 people, sits in this little precious little piece of real estate between Columbia River and Lake Chelan itself. There's a kink in this Lake Chelan called the Narrows, and then we're getting up into the North Cascades that far north. You can take a ferry called the Lady of the Lake from Chelan, and it takes a long time to get all the way up to the head of the lake, and there's a place called Stahican. I think I'm actually scheduled to give a talk in Stahican in August. Um, there's other places to visit along the shore. But the first thing I'd like to ask us is, awkward, why is that lake so deep? Why don't we have a bunch of these deep lakes in Washington? So here's this lake, I don't know if you can read that number from where you are, 1,460 feet deep. The bottom of Lake Chelan is 300 feet below sea level. So there's this incredible trough. I think the elevation of the, the, the lake surface is 1,100 feet elevation. And again, the floor of Lake Chelan is at least 300 feet below sea level. Um, Wikipedia time. Uh, if Lake Chelan is the third deepest lake in uh, North America, or at least the US, the lower 48, uh, where are the other deeper lakes? Number one is Crater Lake, Mount Mazama a deep lake uh, in southern Oregon. That's a volcanic origin for that basin, that trough. And Lake Tahoe down in uh, Nevada slash California, mostly California, the Tahoe area is also a lake that's a little bit deeper, and there's a glacial story with Lake Tahoe, and there is certainly a glacial story with Lake Chelan. Even like there's a glacial story for the depth of Lake Superior and the rest of the Great Lakes back east. Okay, so... Please notice that these are other drainages, rivers, that are flowing out of the Cascades. The Cascade Range is here, so all these rivers are draining away from the Cascades and heading to the Columbia River. You get, with this breeze, you're getting a great look at, do you guys remember Chia Pets? So this is the Yakima River. Notice the trend flowing from northwest to southeast. Here's the Wenatchee River. Here's the Eniat River. 
Here's the Metau River, or the Metau. So there's this trend all through. So I guess my first question is, do we think there used to be a Chelan River? And I think there must have been. I can't prove it, and I haven't read any geologic papers to say that there was a, there was a river drainage occupying this valley pre-Ice Age, but it seems logical to me. So if we just take that as kind of a working model, that we had some sort of existing river drainage of some size before the Ice Age, the lake itself is an Ice Age story, so I'm really kind of getting us to the question of why not here and here also? Why isn't there a Lake Chelan with every one of these things? See, the wind dies down and it's just perfect, so we'll, we'll hope for that. So something, something additional and strange happened during the Ice Age to dig this incredible trench. Well, most of you know this. It's a glacial story. If I'm talking about the Ice Age and I'm talking about glaciers, I guess that means there was some sort of massive glacier that dug to make this trough that Lake Chelan sits in now. Okay, fine. But we need to be more specific than that, don't we? There are different kinds of glaciers. And maybe glaciers are part of all of these drainages past. In fact, they are. So again, what's so unique about Lake Chelan? He goes to the whiteboard. So here is a cartoon of glacial ice in Washington. And you know from a Geology 101 textbook or just by reading online that there are different kinds of glaciers around the world. Primarily, there are two main types of glaciers. You can be a continental glacier otherwise known as an ice sheet that covers a large, large portion of a continent. In this case, this is the Canada ice sheet that's coming all the way down from Santa's house at the North Pole, creeping over the entire country of Canada and getting down here into northern Washington. That ice sheet never got to Ellensburg. I'm talking about this now. That ice sheet, which was 3,000 feet thick at Seattle, which was thousands of feet thick when it crossed the border north of Chelan, that ice sheet was a major player and advanced multiple times, presumably, but the youngest, the most recent advance of this ice sheet got the farthest in Washington. And so we don't have a lot of good evidence of earlier ice sheet advances like we do back in the Midwest, where I'm from. But notice there's also these alpine glaciers which there's kind of this beautiful global dance, essentially. Every time we have a global cool time, we have ice sheets around the world advancing and we have alpine glaciers. It's just like it sounds, those are mountain glaciers. Those are glaciers coming from refrigerated mountaintops and that ice, these alpine glaciers, are these little fingers of ice that are following river valleys. But the dance is, every time we advance this, we advance these alpine glaciers as well, worldwide. And every time we have a warming trend over the course of thousands of years, the ice sheets melt back and the alpine glaciers melt back. So can you do that? Press the button. Animation. Don't have it. Advance, advance, retreat, retreat, advance, advance, retreat, retreat. Multiple times. Okay. Now, this is the Yakima Valley Glacier. I think we'll do a whole session on the Yakima Valley Glacier that followed the Yakima River, and that glacier almost got to Ellensburg, but not quite. But there's no Lake Chelan today. Same with the Wenatchee River Valley. There was a glacier coming down. It made Lake Wenatchee, but that's a little pond compared to Lake Chelan, as far as depth is concerned. So here's the first answer. Why is Lake Chelan so different and so deep compared to these other drainages? And my, my first major point is, we're far enough north, we're far enough north in Washington to have an alpine glacier and an ice sheet glacier history in this particular valley. So if I drew, can I put Lake Chelan onto my whiteboard? Yes, I can.
There it is. Now in that lecture I did on YouTube, which seems to hold up pretty well, I chose to simply say that, that Lake Chelan is only an ice sheet story. And we'll get into the details of why we know there was an ice sheet history there. I, that's what I'm gonna use the key lime pie for somehow. Key lime pie and glaciers, they don't really go together. They will after tonight, hopefully. But I do think there's probably some alpine glaciation history with the Chelan Basin. That's new from the lecture that I gave you. I've just been thinking about it. If the river drainage, if this river drainage was truly a river drainage for a long time, and we had maybe some alpine glaciers coming down the Chelan trough, doing some digging possibly. That's not documented, there's no evidence of that, but it seems likely based on what we have in these other drainages, to me at least. But this last big advance of the ice sheet is gonna do some massive amounts of digging and leave some unusual rocks, and that's the field evidence I'd like to share with you. Okay, let's be a little bit more specific before I go to my key lime pie. Yep. In most cases, if you teach a basic geology class, you view the alpine ice and the continental ice as separate things in separate places. But in northern Washington, we actually had an intersection of both kinds of glaciers. More specifically and more accurately, we have this ice sheet thousands of feet thick that essentially flowed into the mountains. I mean, the mountains are way older than this ice sheet. So we have rugged mountains in the North Cascades. If you've been over uh, Washington 20, you go over Washington Pass and Rainy Pass, there's evidence of alpine glaciers. There's evidence of these little mountain glaciers, for sure. There's still a few hanging on up there, by the way. But in addition to that, the main point, and this is work from John Riedel, who's the geologist at North Cascades National Park, and a few others, we have great evidence that the ice sheet itself flowed into the mountains. The ice sheet itself crossed from one mountain valley to the next. In other words, these jagged ridges we call a rets, which are glacial, alpine glacial features. The ice sheet's just plowing right over the top of them, smoothing over the top of these jagged bedrock ridges. And you can see that with John's work. You gotta hike and get up there and use helicopters and everything else to get in. Don't say the word helicopter. I don't wanna hear that word. That's a bad word in this family, helicopter. So if you're impatient, here we go. We have good evidence that the ice sheet, at least during the last glacial advance, which is roughly 18,000 years ago or 16,000 years ago, somewhere in there, we're gonna take some of this ice sheet and it's gonna come down our Lake Chelan Valley. It's like an ice sheet that's kind of pretending it's an alpine glacier but it's much thicker and it's much more uh, widespread than a little finger of alpine ice. You with me? And if it's coming into the Chelan Valley, and it is, do you need this now? So we've got one, that's an arrow, a big old fat arrow showing our Canadian ice sheet coming through the mountains, through the shingles here, down through, pushing down through, and it's picking up rocks from the Cascades, which are generally light-colored rocks. So there's a lot of granites and other boulders. Kind of lightish rocks, salt and pepper rocks, white rocks, that sort of thing. Rocks from the Cascades are being carried down uh, from the high Cascades and dumped uh, in the floor of Lake Chelan, on the margins of Lake Chelan, etc. And you're like, okay, I guess that kind of explains, and maybe there's some weak rock at the bottom of Lake Chelan, and there is. There's some schist, which is softer than some other neighboring rocks. So it seems like we're kind of getting a sense that something unusual is happening up here, and there is. But there's even more evidence, especially in the lower part of the lake, that's a real stunner.
The ice sheet's also over here. We're talking about less than two million years for sure. In this particular case, we're talking about the ice sheet coming down, let's say 16,000 years ago. And that ice sheet coming down this way is going to push, block the Columbia River. It's gonna continue. If you know something about glacial geology in Washington, I'm talking now about the Okanagan Lobe, which we'll talk a lot about in the next week. The Okanagan Lobe, the Canadian ice sheet right here that's pushing its way down, and I'm, I'll get to it right now. This Okanagan Lobe at its maximum So this is the same ice sheet, but it's got different arms or different lobes, if you want to think of it that way. So we have a massive ice sheet arm pushing down Lake Chelan and digging. But surprisingly, we have this Okanagan lobe that's pushing down into the German chocolate cake, man. This is German chocolate cake. This is flood basalt stuff. I'll show you some good maps in just a second. And this Okanagan lobe is eventually finding its way to Chelan and pushing up the lake. So for many times during this last advance of the ice sheet, we had a baby Lake Chelan, truly a body of water called Lake Chelan, but we call it Glacial Lake Chelan because the water is caught between these two competing arms. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of water coming off those two arms, and so the bathtub continues to rise with Glacial Lake Chelan, GLC, and we have evidence, mostly from John Riedel's work, that there were times that that Glacial Lake Chelan, got, the bathtub got so high or deep in the Chelan trough, it started spilling to the south. And if you know Navarre Cooley or Knapp Cooley, which is on the south side of Lake Chelan, that's a place where some of the glacial Lake Chelan water spilled occasionally during this time when we had these competing arms. An obvious question is, did these two arms ever like smush up next to each other? Probably. I don't know if we have that precision worked out with the deposits, but probably. But let's back away and go to the key lime pie and try to show you the main piece of evidence that we really had ice sheet material from Canada coming over the town of Chelan and flowing up the lake. That seems impossible to believe if this is the first time you've heard it. I don't think this is going to work. It just makes me feel better to say that ahead of time. Okay? What evidence do we have that the Okanagan lobe ice flowed over this area and pushed up the lake? Do you have a guess while I get the pie? Marie Callender's Key Lime Pie in your frozen food section. You gotta love it. All right, soupy sales time here. Just dated myself again. So this is a frozen pie that's uh, rapidly thawing out here in the 60 degree sunshine. And I took some of this, whatever this stuff is, and I pushed it all to the side. So my bright idea, not tested by the way, is to have this be our Okanagan lobe. And uh, what's your answer, by the way? How do we? So let's make. There's the Columbia River flowing to my neighborhood. We're eventually going to make. Lake Chelan, but right now this is just a regular river valley. Okay? Oh. 
This is the ice. Now I said that some of this ice sheet is going to come down the lake. And it's going to bring light colored rock. But I also said that the Okanagan lobe was going to come down and block the Columbia River 16,000 years ago. And it was flow up the lake. How can we be sure that's true? You've all le left your comments. You're all on record. You're, you're bright or you, you know what's going on. I showed you this last week. It's looking at 16 million years ago, much older time, right? Not 16,000, but 16 million years ago, long before the ice sheet. There is no Lake Chelan yet, but what we do have are these fissure style eruptions and this Hawaiian like lava. This is the flood basalt story. This is the German chocolate cake. And notice that we're pushing the Columbia River up to Chelan and these lavas are invading from the southeast and the lavas are burying everything, pushing the Columbia River to Chelan. And the Columbia River hasn't left since that time. The Columbia River was down here prior to 16 million years ago. The lavas pushed the Columbia River up to Chelan and Wenatchee where it still is today. I'm stalling for you. What evidence would we have that the Okanagan lobe approached Chelan from the east? The answer is the Okanagan lobe for just a few miles was flowing over and picking up basalt. Bringing those basalt rocks, the size of my house, by the way, carrying those basalt rocks with the glacial ice to Chelan and even up Lake of Chelan. And so, this is the We have basalt boulders that the Okanagan lobe is carrying as it flows across the Columbia Plateau, meaning between um, Bridgeport and, Ch and Chelan. And the Okanagan lobe is coming up the lake, bringing the basalt boulders. And so that ice is coming this way, this ice is coming down this way. It's meeting, the ice melts away, and what are we left with? A hole that's been cut below sea level by the ice and left on the shores along the lower part of Lake Chelan, down Lake of the Narrows, between the Narrows and the town of Chelan itself. If you know Lake Chelan well, do you know where there's some uh, basalt boulders? Okay, I'm really feeling spunky tonight. I'm gonna try this. I'm going to try to show you an animation and a couple of the boulders. And we'll see if there's enough light and enough video to go. So I'm going to a uh, website, clicking on Nick on the Rocks, it's a series of five minute episodes. I'm going down to Lake Chelan down to crack the mist oh, land. I gotta mute myself here. Uncover buried treasure and see what makes mountains blow. Find out what shapes the top of the earth and explore the secret world below. With me, Nick, on the rocks. Lake 
shellac. Beautiful. How did it form? I got it cranked. This is a vacation paradise with boats and sun and water, apples. Oh, thank you. And wine. What's the geology behind this scenery? <laughs> All right, too much glare. I don't think it's working. It was worth a try. Uh, look for Nick on the Rocks, Lake Chelan, and you'll see this animation that's playing right now where the ice is, shut up, coming down. I'm gonna keep going. And here's the ice coming down Lake Chelan. And here's the ice coming up Lake Chelan and they're meeting. Is that kind of what you had in mind? Some animators in Portland did that for us. I'm gonna stick with it now, because I think you can at least see this. And those are the, look at the size of those boulders. Those are the chocolate chips that I had in the key lime pie. And the fact that those basalt boulders are above the, we'll stick with it till we get this drone shot that Chris Smart was able to get right above the lake. Got tipped off by a guy named Shane Collins who lives in the area. And I said, Shane, can you help us find a few of these basalt boulders? Not just McNeil. Can Here we go. Look at that. That's right in a subdivision on the Manson side. Oh, that's a beauty. There's no other way to explain those basalt boulders perched above the lake without having the ice come in from the east. Thanks for playing along with me. I'll be curious to see if that was a total disaster on your end or not. 6.30. Give me 10 minutes. We're going to talk about the rock of Lake Chelan, the bedrock, and then we'll go to your live Q&A. Okay? So, I didn't think to grab a migmatite from school. We've got a bunch of these big boulders of migmatite, but that's the main kind of rock I want to share with you. So, if you have driven from Wenatchee up to Chelan, you know you're getting close if you start seeing road cuts, you know, where there's rocks that are exposed along the highway. They did some dynamite and they blasted the rock away so they could put the road in. You know you're getting close to Chelan if you can find a bunch of this zebra-looking rock. And I could have shown you that too, but whatever. That's also featured in that little episode. The zebra-looking rock, black and white swirls within this very unique-looking rock. I think even if you're not a fan of geology, you must be interested in what that rock is, I would think. If nothing else, just to put a couple in your yard or whatever. That rock is called migmatite, which is a very unusual rock. It's actually kind of tough to categorize. It's kind of half metamorphic, half igneous. And for a long time, I didn't understand the significance of the Chelan migmatite complex which is the formal name of this bedrock around the town of Chelan on the shores of the Columbia River and also in the banks of the lower uh, Lake Chelan itself. But I happened to work with a guy named Chris Mattinson and his main research top, one of his main research focus uh, points is that megmatite. And he's learned a lot about it in uh, just a few years. Let me give you the bullet points. How are you supposed to get a metamorphic slash igneous rock to begin with? That doesn't make any sense. First of all, the migmatite is older than 100 million years. So this is a weird lecture where we started with the glacial stuff that's like less than 2,000 million. We started with the glacial stuff, which is like 16,000 years ago. Then we did a quick visit to the basalts that were 16 million. And now we're finishing the little session, you and I, with the oldest, by far the oldest rocks in the area, which are way older than 100 million years. This is back at the dinosaur time, this megmatite that's exposed on the shores of the Lake Chelan area south of the Narrows. And yes, if you're thoroughly wide awake, if we're talking about rock that's older than 100 million years and it's in Washington, it probably came from Mexico. So you got zebra rock, that's exotic enough, but now we have exotic with a capital E because a lot of these rocks between Chelan and Wenatchee 
are starting to show specific signs of coming from Mexico originally. That's not our focus. Our focus is where does the migmatite form, whether we're in Mexico originally or not. Let's just focus on where does it form. Well, here's a stratovolcano. We talked about the Cascades last week. Here's a magma chamber in the crust of the earth, you know, 10 miles down, 15 miles down. Okay, that's not our topic either, because that's igneous, right? Our ghost volcanoes and all that. That's not what we're talking about tonight. It is extremely rare to get a chance to look at rocks that formed below a magma chamber to find rocks that are telling us about the mechanics, kind of taking a peek at the engine room, essentially, where the sausage is made, man. Like what's going on in this mysterious area below these magma chambers in the lower levels of the crust, but above the mantle? That's what we think the magmatites are telling us about. And I can't give you the details of the chemistries and the physics of what's going on down there. But what I can tell you is that this rock, which was easily deeper than 30 miles below Chelan, was formed down there. And then since that time has been lifted up the geologic elevator all the way to the surface. And oh, by the way, probably in Mexico. That gives you maybe new interest in stopping and looking at this migmatite. If you know the drive from the Columbia over the BB Bridge and then going up to the town of Chelan, there's that amazing road cut that they blasted off the front of that. And it's just a sheer wall of all this swirly zebra rock. That's it. That's the best place to stop and look, even though it's kind of dangerous. There's a lot of cars and trucks going back and forth with all the orchards. But that migmatite is right there at the surface with Chelan, but it was originally down here. So the last thing I want to do with this, it's, it's just a, a very cursory introduction to this migmatite, mostly because I don't know a lot about it. But the cool thing for me is that if you know the drive, it's gone now, from Chelan to Bridgeport. Do you know that drive? along the Columbia River, Chelan to Bridgeport. Chelan to Bridgeport is basically this picture turned on its side. There's new work being done to try to find a chemistry match and some age matches between the migmatite, which is on display in Chelan, and the granite that's on display closer to Bridgeport. So just driving from Chelan to Bridgeport, you're maybe driving through this original volcanic arc in Mexico, but now it's been turned on its side. So here's Chelan, here's Bridgeport, and the Columbia River is giving you a cross-section through an old volcanic arc lying on its side. Last thing I'll say just verbally. 1872, December, there was a magnitude estimated 7.4 on the Richter scale magnitude in eastern Washington. Again, the biggest earthquake in Washington state history since the Civil War. Not as big as the great earthquake we talked about last time. That was magnitude nine, but that was the year 1700. I'm talking about the year 1872. Now there's just a few white folks in the area. It's sparsely settled by white folks. Of course, there's amazing communities of Native Americans all through that area. And that earthquake struck on that cold December night, 915 local time. And we know that from eyewitness accounts. But between 1872 and 2014, nobody knew where the earthquake actually happened. We didn't have instruments. We didn't have Wenatchee paper, a Chelan paper at the time. And so there was Walla Walla paper, Seattle paper, Portland paper. They're all, they all kind of saying there was a big, you know, tumbler, big, big, a big, big shaker over there somewhere in Eastern Washington, I guess. 
but nobody knew where the epicenter was. Nobody knew where the actual fault scarp was until 2014. So there's this technique now called LIDAR, where you can magically, with your computer, strip away all the trees and get a naked view of the ground surface. And a geologist named Brian Sherrod, with help from John Lasher and a few others, found the scarp and found evidence at the fault scarp where the ground broke cleanly, so a reverse fault, in Spencer Canyon, which is a, not a common, not a well-known canyon. It's um, north of Wenatchee, south of Chelan. Spencer Canyon is on the west side of the Columbia River, just across the river from Orondo, if you know where that is. So that was really exciting to finally be able to put our finger right on the scarp from 1872. And why is that such a big deal? Well, that's a big earthquake in Eastern, on our side of the Cascades. I mean, generally, I think people know that earthquakes are an issue here in Washington, but they think Western Washington for good reason. That's the trench and that's the Seattle fault and things like that. But if we had a big earthquake like that with hardly any folks living in the area, and now we have a similar sized earthquake with much more population and hydroelectric dams and nuclear reactors, whatever. It's, it's, it's suddenly an important topic, more important than it was before. So the studies continue with that as well. That paper's flopping around. Let me get that down. That's bugging me. Uppercase for you. We'll do some live Q&A at 640. Looking forward to answering your questions. Hope that treated you well. Scrolling back with his magic fingers. Are the Chelan migmatites related to the migmatite in the North Cascades National Park? Uh, probably, um, but the North Cascades National Park, if you've seen a geologic map, I don't have it tonight, I don't think. I mean, it's a mess. It depends on your view of things. If you're a cocky person who is very bright and you're 31, you're like, let me at it, I'll figure it all out. Let me loosen the North Cascades. These guys can't figure out what's going on. I'll knock it out in a couple of decades. Well, you eventually realize it's very difficult to negotiate the landscape of the North Cascades, just physically. And then there's an incredible number of exotic terrains of different ages and different rock types that all have different histories. Some of them from Mexico, some of them not. And we're just starting to put some basic relationships together. So it could be exactly the same migmatite, uh, Justin, if you're thinking of a specific spot that's different from the Chelan area. Uh, there's lots of faults that have offset bedrock units, so that could be the case if, you, if you're thinking of migmatite that's not right in Chelan. But about anything's uh, possible. And there's a geologist that I think very highly of, Mike Eddy, who has done a lot of very interesting work in the last few years. He's just out of school. He's just starting a, a research lab at Purdue University. He wants to continue working out some of these relationships in the North Cascades. And so I'm trying to learn as much as I can uh, to be involved in that project. Uh, so I need to dig more into this, is my point. I think I'm heading up there a fair amount uh, over the next few years to kind of at least get up to speed on what we know. What caused that uplift? How did we get that rock all the way to the surface from whatever number I said, 30 miles down? There's many different ways to answer that, especially since we're taking, let's just, not, all, not everybody believes in Baja BC, but you know that I do. So let's just go ahead and say, this is, this is rock that was 30 miles below the surface in Mexico and then got moved 2000 miles to the north and in the process got tipped on its side and therefore uplifted. You can do that in a variety of ways. The simplest way would be, remember that clockwise rotation where we're taking Southern Oregon uh, and moving it and, and Western Washington and moving it up and, and, and Canada's not rotating. So you can think of Northern Washington being lifted and compressed because everything's rotating North um, 
into the area? That's a vague answer, but I'm afraid uh, we're pretty vague on some of that. Are there nice rocks around there also? Ha ha. So nice, you know, is another metamorphic rock. I'm kind of showing you a nice here, although not really. So nice is, uh, looks like a granite at first glance. Let me find that. So this is the Mount Stewart granite, but I'm, I can basically use it to help you uh, see other units. There's, the, there's a lot of different kinds of granites in the Chelan area, many of them quite a bit younger than Mount Stewart. In fact, many of them are from that chalice time that we were talking about last week. But the point is, you're looking at a granite or a granodiorite, and you notice that there's no real organization with these minerals. They're kind of randomly interlocking like jigs jigsaw puzzle pieces. Would you agree? So this is not a metamorphic gneiss. This is an igneous rock called, let's just say, granite. But what happens if you take this granite and then you continue to squeeze it? And, I don't know, squeeze it from the left and the right. This rock's too heavy. I can't do it that way. Can you, can you bring in fists from the left and the right and squeeze it? If we do that, then we take the minerals, not great. Uh, I'll bring in a metamorphic gneiss uh, that's better. This is a granite. This is more of a metamorphic gneiss. I promise, I'll put that on the list. I'll bring in a nice. The answer is yes. And the, there is schist, which is kind of a, a mica-rich metamorphic rock where the micas are foliated. In other words, they're lined up parallel to each other. That schist is quite soft. And the deepest part of Lake Sh I didn't even show you that. This is a beautiful poster done by somebody. Copyright 1974 by Wally Peterson. Good job, Wally. So it's not only a map, but a cross section of Lake Chelan. I can zoom in and show you the map part of it first of all. So we can see the town of Chelan is over here. And Stahican is over here, 50 miles long. And remember, I'm telling you, this is not a dammed river. This is not a reservoir. This is not artificial. This is a natural lake. But what got me reminded that I wanted to show you this is that at the very deepest part of the lake, which is a few hundred feet below sea level, uh, there's schist. And so many geologists have made a connection between that soft metamorphic schist, relatively speaking, and where that Sh Lake Chelan trough is the deepest. Now, is that a coincidence or is that true? Probably a little bit of both. I feel like there's more to the digging story than just that last ice sheet advance. That's my own personal belief, but I don't have much to back it up. I had some other cool stuff I wanted to show you. I was talking about Daniel Coe last time from Washington Geological Survey. Here's Dan at it again, which looks kind of similar to what we were just talking about. This is available at the Washington Geological Survey. But he's got, I want you to, I want you to see this cross section. He says, uh, hey, uh, Lake Chelan at its deepest is two and a half space needles. It's kind of a cute way to give you a feeling for depth. So in other words, at the Narrows, I'm not flipping you off, and over by the town of Chelan, the lake is not that deep. But two-thirds of the way up the lake is where we have this incredible depth. The wind is calm right now, so let me take advantage. This is 
what we used to get excited about before the internet called Raven Maps. And I've had this for a long time and I still use it a fair amount. And it's so old I feel fine about folding it up and using it however I want. So this is a nice way to see Town of Chelan, Lake Chelan heading up. But what I like here is look at how different it looks out here. This is the German chocolate cake. That's where the, la the basalt lavas are. And so that's where our, our uh, glaciers coming across the key lime pie, picking up basalts and then dropping those basalt erratics uh, as far west as the Narrows at Lake Chelan. And you can see to the south, here's my backyard down here. And you can just see a lot of these northwest, southeast valleys. Uh, Dan, Dan's poster is now across the street. I'm sorry, I'm not getting to all your, let me, let me move along here. Is, it at, is the lake at its deepest uh, near Point Lovely in the town of Manson? According to those posters I just saw, no, it's uh, halfway between Manson and Stehekin. There's a bunch of landslides that have happened right at the Narrows. I think that's part of the reason that there's a Narrows there. And I remember being on a field trip with Chris Mattinson and a few others just a few years ago, and I said, I wonder if that's 1872. Oh, you know, I've got this connection, at least in my brain, potentially between big earthquakes and landslides. But there's been no dating technique yet uh, to confirm that. Is Chelan sitting on a moraine or terminal moraine that's damming the lake? Bruce, good question. I think there's a conventional answer to that, and I'm not sure I believe it. So maybe Bruce and maybe you noticed that at the, at the lower part of the lake, there's an incredible pile of sediment. So you see further up the lake, we don't have a lot of, I think that's true. I think we have basically um, findings to see, or what's the word? Dig through the lake and get the depth of the sediment at the bottom. But here, there's an incredible pile. Now, I think the questions are, what's the origin of this incredible pile of sediment? Is there a scale on this? Yeah, there's like 400 feet of this loose sediment that's kind of filling this trough. They're inferring that the trough that I guess like, well, I don't know, but they're, they're, the bedrock, the true bedrock is 400 feet below Chelan. So I think it's a fair question that I don't know if I, I'm totally with the answer. We've got a lot of choices for the origin of this sediment, don't we? I guess the first thought is it's glacial moraine material. That's what Bruce was suggesting. So in other words, is this stuff that was brought down the lake by the ice sheet coming out of the Cascades? Okay. And dumping a bunch of this here and making the lake, damming the river that was there before, I guess. Is this mostly chocolate chips? Is this a bunch of stuff coming from the Okanagan Lobe coming in from the east and dropping a bunch of this material? Because there are the chocolate chips, the, the big milk duds uh, above this area. My personal favorite, again, I don't think anybody's really figured this out. Uh, forgive me if you're a geologist watching and you've already figured it out. I, I'm, I'm ignorant of your work. Is it possible this is an Ice Age flood story? Now, in our series, we haven't talked about the Ice Age floods yet. But a little sneak peek to tomorrow with Jay Harlan Bretz and especially Thursday with the Grand Coulee and these Missoula floods. We're going to have biblical floods coming over the German chocolate cake, many of them happening during the Okanagan lobe that's in place. But there's also very good evidence for at least one major Ice Age flood. I'm giving away stuff from Thursday now, but I can't help it. There's at least one major Ice Age flood that followed the Columbia and came right by Chelan. 
And I wonder if all that stuff was dumped by the Ice Age flood coming down the Columbia River. In fact, there's one massive Ice Age flood before the Okanagan Lobe advanced for the last time, and a couple of big floods after the Okanagan Lobe got busted up. So this stuff isn't readily available. You gotta, you know, do whatever to get through the water to get down there. But that, to me, that would make a very interesting project. And there might be another option that I'm not thinking of at the moment. We'll do a few more. It seems like we should have all sorts of different kinds of questions here. Is the deepest part of the lake where the Okanagan Lobe and the Northern Ice Sheet Mount met? No, the, if those two arms that were battling of the ice sheet, if they truly did meet, it was right at the narrows. And the deepest part of the lake is 15 miles further up the lake. That's why I wonder about the significance of the Okanagan Lobe digging. Maybe it already just kind of came in late and just brought in some of the chocolate chips, but didn't do a lot of digging. Patrick, hello. I love your stories. Do most places, uh, this is age six, do most places on earth have as many stories that connect together as the Pacific Northwest, or are we just lucky here? Patrick, we're just lucky here. That's a biased answer, uh, but it's hard to imagine other places in the world that have as much going on. There are certainly other places that rival what we have, but that list that you heard at the beginning of the, of the session here, ice age floods, lavas, cascades, faults, earthquakes, come on, really? That's why I'm here. Uh, I'm, I'm fighting through uppercase jokes now. Hey, man. How did the rocks come all the way from Mexico and when? And um, if you feel like going back a few live streams, we had a session called Baja BC. You can find the replays and watch them. It was last week sometime. And um, we looked at some evidence to prove that the Swakane biotite nice just above Wenatchee, Mount Stewart just north of Ellensburg have some detailed pieces of evidence that are now convincing many of us that they were originally in Mexico and got moved along San Andreas fault-like structures over the course of about 30 million years between about 90 and 60 million years ago. You'll have to watch that one if, if you want more. Does the slow slip two weeks have a horizontal aspect? Yes, it does, but I don't see that helping us here with our discussion here tonight. Maybe we should do a slow slip earthquake uh, meeting. Why is Lake Chelan so deep? Tried to answer that tonight, Jesse. Is, uh, what would a scarp look like to an observer on the ground? Well, if it's fresh, that's the term we have, a fresh scarp, meaning, you know, you just broke the crust. Like, let's say there was an earthquake in my backyard right now, and, and uh, half of my backyard just dropped by a foot compared to the other part of the backyard. There'd be a, a one-foot-high stair step, basically. And that's what a scarp is. You can actually see where the ground broke and, and one side shifted down or the other side shifted up. In the case of that 1872 quake, it was a reverse fault, so it was the hanging wall side that went up. So if you're out walking around on the ground, you're truly just looking for that. You're looking for an exposed place where the, where the ground broke. It's that simple. And you're like, well, why did it take more than 100 years? To, yeah, more than 100 years to find that. Spencer Canyon's a remote place. It's private property, I think. Um, and there's a lot of trees and other things in the way. Plus, it's a scarp that's been sitting there for more than 100 years, so it's not quite as fresh as you'd like. Uh, but that's, I guess, my answer. Was Lake Chelan the Columbia River at one point? I understand why you ask that. And there are places where we have the Columbia River flowing at different locations at different times. But the orientation 
of that lake heading to the northwest up into the high cascades makes it very difficult for anybody to visualize the Columbia River flowing up that far. Because remember, we're pushing the Columbia We're pushing the Columbia because of those lavas. And so it, I think it's impossible to think of another way that we could get the Columbia River even further uh, up, like flowing up or up the valley. I, 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 nobody's entertained that. And if they have, there's no way to, to, to find evidence for it. Did the Okanagan Lobe leave a moraine on the cake? Yes, it did. Uh, that's the Waterville Plateau. And yeah, let's do a session on that. There's amazing glacial deposits where you have a glacial moraine, you have glacial eskers, you have some kettles. In other words, features that I know back where I'm from in Wisconsin, but that ice sheet was here and north of, um, well, up in here, there are some very beautiful and easy to find Glacial deposits. Is there any geological? The Lake Narrows is mostly a landslide story. I don't know how else to explain that jog in the lake. Spencer Canyon fault capable of producing tsunamis on Lake Chelan? Interesting thought. Magnitude 7.4, which again is an estimate just based on some of those eyewitness, you know, a couple of settlers talking about how much their cabin shook and a church bell was tolling in Olympia or whatever. I don't remember the details. So they're taking all those kind of uh, personal experiences and trying to generate a magnitude, estimated magnitude. Would you create a tsunami at Lake Chelan? I don't think there's any evidence for that. I guess it would surprise me, especially, well, it's more of a physics question, I guess. There's nothing obvious that says there was a tsunami, but I guess we can't rule it out. By the way, if you know Earthquake Point or Ribbon Cliffs, same place, that was thought to be the epicenter of that earthquake. But since we found the fault scarp south of Eniat, we now know that, that Ribbon Cliff or Earthquake Point is not where the ground broke, but it is where a mountain split and a landslide fell into the Columbia and, and blocked the Columbia for a little while but not the actual place where the fault was. Is the Spencer Canyon part of the Eniot Fault? I don't think so, but I don't know the details of the trend of where the Eniot Fault is. It's in the neighborhood for sure. How deep is the sediment? We just covered that. Why is the magma chamber tipped over to the east? Yeah, I wish I could answer that. Basically, why are we tipping this picture? Why are we lifting that magmatite? There's so many variables and so much transport and so much time. I can't give you a, a, an intelligent answer. Is there any evidence of cascade volcanic material near Lake Chelan? Cascade volcanic material. If you mean ash, I don't know of any ash. Oh, by the way, <laughs> you remember I showed you last week uh, some St. Helens ash that fell in Ellensburg in 1980. And I was playing with it, you know, in front of the camera and it was just what our ash looked like. Well, Jim in Entiat said, uh, I want to send you some of the ash that I collected uh, in Ephrata. Uh, Jim in Ephrata. And his ash is definitely finer, a little bit further away from the mountain, makes sense. But he said, your ash doesn't look right. I think he said ash. Your ash doesn't look right. Uh, this, uh, so I don't know of any obvious ash at, at, at uh, Chelan, if that's what you're asking. If you're thinking more like, are there rocks brought down into the Lake Chelan trough that are cascade rocks? The answer is definitely yes. The Narrows are not a glacial moraine. All right, let me give you let me give you one more thing to th I'll go down to see the freshest stuff here. Did the two ice flows meet at the high point of the lake in your diagram, the high point of the lake? They met at the narrows. 
What's the elevation difference between Lake Chelan and the nearest part of the Columbia River? Oh. Four hundred, five hundred feet, maybe. So it is a pretty cool. Um, so if you're on 97 and you're driving up river from Wenatchee uh, and you cross at the bridge, yeah, you got to climb. Uh, the lake level is 1,100 feet above sea level, and the Columbia is at 700. Yeah, so it's a 400 foot climb. So that's our 400 feet of of sediment that you're climbing. And again, I, I think the origin of the sediment is interesting and maybe not totally figured out. I was about to tell you something to finish. I can't remember what it is now. A lot of questions over the over these sessions about the uh, Olympic Wallawa lineament. It's so mysterious that it's hard to do a, a program on it, but it's off track of the owl. Are the rocks south of Pateros along 97 part of the moraine? They're not part of the moraine, but there are those 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 haystack rocks. I call them milk duds. In the case of the key lime pie, I, I called them uh, chocolate chips. I wanted to say one more thing before we wrapped up. Can't do it. Okay, a toast for you. The wind's picking up. This is good timing. All right, let's let's. Uh, show you the schedule. Please join us tomorrow for a Ice Age flood discussion of Jay Harlan Bretz. I'm mostly going to be talking about who he was as a person and what his experiences were like before he arrived in Washington, which was very interesting to me. I didn't know any of that. If you know the basic Jay Harlan Bretz story, I've got a bunch of backstory on him essentially. Grand Coulee on Thursday night, 6 p.m. Major Ice Age floods discussion, Dry Falls, Moses Cooley will be thrown in there, etc. Saturday, 9 o'clock in the morning, only on Facebook Live. Sunday, 9 o'clock in the morning, back here on the YouTube channel, Super Volcanoes. And I'll give you more details as we go along. I appreciate you joining us tonight. Let's make this trough a little deeper, shall we? Here's to you and your health. Here's to the health of your parents and your grandparents. Here's to the health of your children and your grandchildren. We're making the deepest lake in the world now. Here's to the health of your neighbors and your mailmen and your grocery store clerks and the healthcare workers, everybody who's stepping up in a big way to make us all feel a little bit more comfortable that we will get through this as a planet. Here's to you. Jay Harlan Bretz tomorrow night, six o'clock Pacific time. Thanks for checking in with us tonight. Good night from Ellensburg, Washington.